Buddy Questwise back again with another awesome video and today I want to talk about world building and I know that there's a lot of videos out there a lot of tutorials a lot of books out there on world building so I don't want to touch on world building in role-playing games in the same way those others do there's some great ones out there Cobalt Press has an amazing book on world building I think it was written by Wolfgang Bauer um, there's just a bunch of stuff out there on just traditional types of world building. And you can find those in Dungeon Master Guides and Game Master Guides, you know, across the, across the spectrum. What I want to talk about today is warped world building, taking your game to another level, taking your game, stretching it, your, you know, taking your traditional tabletop role game playing game and trying to stretch it as far to the boundaries as you possibly can. And we're going to do a series of these videos. So this will be the first one. And the first one's going to be about visitation fiction. So what do I mean by visitation fiction? Well, in the book world, visitation fiction refers to uh, fiction in which the characters are transplanted from their world that they're familiar with into a completely different world where they have to deal with completely new circumstances new enemies, new peoples, new races, new languages, possibly even new physics, okay? And so uh, that's what I want to focus on today. I want to take that aspect of visitation fiction and bring it into your tabletop role-playing games. Now, let me give you a few examples. If you don't know what I'm still what I'm talking about, and I'll put up some, some pics of some of the, the titles up here as well too, but uh, The Chronicles of Thomas Covenant by Stephen Donaldson. A story about a character, obviously Thomas Covenant, who's transplanted from uh, modern day Earth. They were written in the 80s, so 80s Earth. And taking to this other world uh, where he becomes known as a hero, um, mostly because of certain circumstances uh, that had happened to him in Earth, which translate to this other world as making him a hero. And he's sort of an anti-hero in the book. And I don't want to go into the detail about the whole thing. Um, but the idea that he has left Earth where it is his home and he's comfortable into this new transition. The Barsoom series, or Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs, very, very classic visitation fiction where John Carter, our hero, falls asleep on Earth and wakes up on Mars. Um, again, and, then he, and, then, and in that one, he, dif he faces different physics as well, too. He's stronger, he's faster, he's you know more of a hero than he was here on Earth. The Fion, I always say this wrong, Fionovar Tapestry, which begins with The Summer Tree, uh, as that trilogy by Guy Gavriel Kay. Again, a very classic idea of, of modern teenage kids transferring into a fantasy world. And if that sounds familiar, it's because the Dungeons and Dragons cartoon of the 80s did the same exact thing, where the kids all got onto a Dungeons and Dragons roller coaster ride on Earth. And they were transported into the Dungeons and Dragons universe. So keep an eye on that one as well, too. There's also what has a little bit of a quirky twist on the idea is the Rift War, Rift War Cycle by Raymond Feist. It starts off with Magician Apprentice, Magician Master. They were one book and were split into two. The idea that a race coming from a different dimension... Uh, was brought into the dimension of the characters, and then there was this rift war. So rather than the characters going to a different world, uh, a different world had come to them. Uh, interesting thing. And one of my all-time favorites by Terry Brooks, Magic Kingdom for Sale, sold. Um, classic tale of a, of a, of a guy who, who loses basically everything in life except for money, decides to buy a Magic Kingdom he sees for sale in the newspaper, and uh, is pleasantly and not so pleasantly surprised when he arrives and finds out that it is a real life thing. So that's the idea of stuff I'm talking about, the idea of visitation fiction. And how can we incorporate that into our role-playing games, our tabletop role-playing games, as a narrative to sort of push world-building to its limit, to push it, to see how stretch it, these games and see how far that they can actually go Um in creating stories and I've always been fascinated by you know we, we, we fall into the traditional tropes of um, you know looting the dungeon assaulting the castle 
um, blowing up the Death Star, those kinds of things. We fall into those a lot of those things, and those are fun. Don't get me wrong; those are very, very fun tropes to play. Um, and Dungeons and Dragons wouldn't be as popular as as it is today if it were not for Dungeons and Dragons. So don't don't get me wrong; I'm not saying that those types of games are not fun. What I'm saying is, is that I've always been interested in and stepping outside of those tropes and trying to push the game as far as it will go. Like how far can we push these rules and this narrative and still be able to tell a great story without sort of breaking down into sort of debates about physics and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I've, I've grabbed a couple things today and I have some ideas I'd like to share with you. Um, just checking my notes here. Sorry about that. Um, cool. So one of the ideas I was thinking about as well too Y'all know I'm a huge Palladium fan. If you've watched any of the videos, you understand that. Um, but I was I was thinking about using this, the Megaverse Builder. And in uh, in Rifts also does a game called Dead Rain, which is a zombie apocalypse game. But it also gives you rules in Dead Rain to run normal, average, everyday people. You can create just average Joes and Janes. Um, to play in a game because that's the whole idea of that game is that you are a survivor. You're just a normal person living in the, in the mega, you know, in the zombie apocalypse as it happens. So what I thought would be interesting is that the megaverse builder actually gives, um, it allows game masters to build new dimensions and a variety of other things, but it also has a expanded, um, section in here on the shifter, which is the shifter is a, a, a character which is able to shift between different dimensions. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to make a shifter as an NPC who arrives on earth and, and has lost something valuable and must take the, the PCs, the player characters who he meets there, who have sort of protected him and saved him. Um, and he must take them with him back through the dimensions. And so you're, you're taking the idea of, of people from earth and you're, you're transporting them to a different world or worlds, multiple worlds. And in that, um, stretching the fiction, how far can you go? And this book really pushes the boundaries of what is, um, playable in a role-playing game. I mean, the dimensions can be really, really crazy. Uh, they can be completely made of magic or completely devoid of magic or completely full of um, fire and, and demons or just a block of ice. I mean, there's a billion different combinations in here. And this, and this, the Megaverse Builder does it very, very well. So that's just one of my thoughts I thought was would be kind of a cool idea. Um, uh, again, you know, of course you can always do it in D&D. &D. Um, you know, D&D &D is, again, you can kind of mimic the, t the cartoon show uh, with the idea that the, you know, kids uh, transported into a thing. I believe... And I can't remember a fifth edition, and I and I haven't really looked at this yet. But I mean, I, I I played this game numerous times, but I haven't really looked in depth into uh, whether or not you used to be able to create zero level characters uh, in some of the earlier editions. I'm not sure if you can actually still do it. I feel like I read something in here before that you can create zero level characters uh, in the Dungeon Master's Guide for Fifth Edition, and that would be a great way to create just average, normal, everyday people and take them into. Um, uh, you know, crazy, crazy worlds into, into the D and D world and, um, play that out, that aspect of characters who know, um, you know, what earth is like in modern day and uh, have them try to survive in a world full of magic and, and dragons and goblins and stuff. Um, another great one would be GURPS. GURPS lets you do basically anything. I heard once this game was called the greatest game that nobody ever plays. It does take some math. Um, and it has a lot of, uh, the workload is very heavily skewed towards the game master itself, but GURPS is a fantastic game and it lets you do basically anything you want to do. Uh, I love using GURPS when I have one of these crazy ideas of like, Hey, how can I stretch the narrative beyond whatever? Um, GURPS allows me to do that. It's a great toolboxy type game that allows me to, to create those aspects that I can envision in my head and give them game terms that I can bring to the table as well too. Uh, so GURPS is a great one as well too. And what's great about GURPS and what I love about GURPS, what I love using GURPS for is historical games. Um, and the idea that maybe modern day folks being transported, time traveling to different time periods and interacting inside those narratives, inside the story of, the Civil War, the assassination of Lincoln, of Kennedy, of 
uh, the civil rights movement, of um, the War of the Roses, you know, going back to ancient Greece and the fall of Troy. You know, that's this is the kind of game that allows you to do that. The, the slave revolt of Spartacus. I mean, those are the kind of things. And it's interesting to take characters who have modern day skills and taking them back into a historical time period and seeing what happens. Because in certain types, you know, if you have, say, you take a doctor from modern day who has modern day uh, medical skills and goes back to, say, Salem during the witch trials, instantly, you know, because of his knowledge is far advanced from what that time period is, that creates an entire narrative just in that fact alone. Now the witch trials are kicked up because he knows things and is able to perform these miracles or, you know, you know, powers of the devil, as it were, to, um, you know, to, to do things that are going to be considered at that time satanic or, you know, witchcraft. Uh, so interesting, interesting stuff. And I love to use GURPS uh, for historical games, uh, mostly, that kind of thing. Uh, the other one I thought would be really, really fun, and I really, really, really want to do this. Dungeon Crawl Classics, um, yes. Because why? It's Dungeon Crawl Classics. It is awesome. It is built to basically run zero-level characters, um, to start them off. And in fact, it's encouraged to run what they call a funnel, which is you, every, every player creates multiple zero level characters and runs them through this meat grinder of a funnel. Um, and whoever survives, if anybody survives at all, that becomes your first level character. So it'd be interesting to create first level characters. Uh, you might have to skew some of the things in here a little bit. Like for instance, it's skewed heavily towards fantasy. So you might want to give, you know, some of the skills that you get as a zero level character or the weapon or something you might want to upgrade. And maybe instead of a uh, pitchfork, you get a machete or, you know, something that effect or whatever to make it a little bit more modern. But the idea that um, uh, your characters, characters uh, are transported back or across dimensions into a fantasy world and must survive this sort of meat grinder 1970s style awesome fantasy funnel. Uh, I think would be a blast, and in fact, I'm I'm kind of working on that as maybe a one shot for a local place as well too. But so Dungeons and Crawl Classics. Now, having said all that, why why would you want to do something like that? Like why what what you know quest wise, what is it that's making you want to do these kind of crazy things? Well, for one, it and now you can do this as a it, it, this works best if it is a beginning of a brand new campaign. It's a little bit more difficult to start in the middle of a campaign, though if you read the Rift War stuff by uh, Raymond Feist, it, it makes a little bit more sense because what he does it drops, you know, his the idea of the Rift War drops right in the middle of, of everything else. So you have characters that are very well established in a fantasy world when this other sort of dimension invades. Um, so it's very possible to do the same sort of thing in your game to be in the middle of a campaign and then have this other dimension, this other realm either appear or the characters go to the other realm. Uh, specifically Ravenloft. That's a very, uh, that's the one that peaks, you know, the most on that scale. It's sort of like characters, they're, you know, in the woods, the fog rolls in and, and then all of a sudden they wake up and they're in Ravenloft. So that's the middle of a campaign kind of thing. But this whole idea of sort of stretching it beyond its boundaries works really well if you start as a, as at, at the beginning of a campaign with this kind of stuff. And the reason for that is because you want to have characters who have skills from a different world. So like in the instance of Ravenloft, you're generally going from fantasy to fantasy. So some from, from fantasy to gothic fantasy. So the skills are going to translate over very well. So, you know, the, the, the ability to use a sword is the same as the ability to use a sword, you know, in, in both worlds. So what's interesting is about starting it as a new campaign is that if you're going from modern day or a historical modern day on Earth, those skills will be different than what they're going to be on your fantasy world or sci-fi world or horror world or whatever you want to do. I'm just using fantasy as, as sort of the default setting. Um, so the ability to do modern medicine in a fantasy world is going to be very interesting. It's going to make some very, very interesting role-playing moments. The ability to know how to make gunpowder in a fantasy world, 
traditional fantasy world is going to be an immensely strong influence on that world and make some very interesting narrative um, uh, storytelling ideas. Another example would be um, the knowledge of modern day physics and or chemistry and or science in, as a whole in a fantasy, traditional fantasy world, again, makes some very, very interesting storytelling moments. The other thing, too, is that people, when I like to do, and this is the reason I like to do this kind of stuff, is because my players, the players who are making the characters, uh, and all I tell them is, hey, you're making a zero-level character, and you're human, and you're from Earth. Um, choose a profession. What do you want to be? Police officer, a doctor, an airplane pilot, a short order cook, whatever it be. Um, they create those characters and then those skills are what stretches their role playing abilities um, to the limit. How would a short order cook perform in a fantasy world? How would a airline pilot fair in a fantasy world? Obviously he knows something about like aerodynamics and such. Um, would he be like the sort of Da Vinci of the fantasy world or would he, you know, take to collaborating together and be creating the first sort of air force on the back of giant eagles, you know, those kind of things. There's a lots of great ideas that sort of pour out of these characters in a foreign land kind of story, this visitation fiction. Um, it also changes the player's perception. Uh, it makes them think, a little bit harder about role playing. Um, they're now in a very, very I mean, They lived in Earth, which is, you know, I guess fairly dangerous, but uh, is is completely safe compared to entering in a world of of history full of knights or disease or um, riots and revolts. Um, magic, of course, you know, like you you come from a land of science and technology and going to a land of magic is, is, would be baffling to characters. And I love to stretch those role-playing opportunities and see how those things come out. It also allows a lot for game master experimentation. It allows the game master or the dungeon master or whatever game you're playing to stretch their imagination and allows them to flex those muscles of of experimentation to make a better game master i truly believe that the more you use your imagination muscle the better it's going to be the stronger it's going to be and so even if that campaign falls flat or even if it just doesn't turn out well because the, doing something like this does take a lot of prep time and it does take a lot of research especially if you're going to do a historical game um it, it, uh, it takes a lot of time and effort on, on the game master's part, um, especially if you're trying to pull off a strictly historical setting. Now, if you're doing alternate history, it leaves you a little bit more flexibility. But as a game master, you, you want to know the time period. You want to know, you want to do your research, you want to read into that time period. Same thing with, with you know, something like Dungeon Crawl Classics. You want to have a nice firm hold on the world that your characters are going into. Um and, and I always use Earth as sort of the basis of the, the whole thing because, you know, our modern day is easy for all of us to un understand and comprehend. Um, uh, but so it takes a little bit more work on the Game Master's part of things to know the physics and the, and the, the you know, the, the power behind the fantasy world or the historical world or the science fiction world or wherever it is you're taking the characters. But I think it's a great way to bring players out of their comfort zone, let them stretch their imagination a little bit as well. And it definitely creates a stronger imagination muscle for the game master and makes them better game masters and everything else that they do. So what do you guys think? Visitation fiction in role-playing games, stretching the boundaries of what you know, pushing that narrative to the absolute boundaries of its edge. Let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to be this kind of thing. I'd love to see some video responses if you guys do any of that kind of stuff as well, too. Other YouTubers out there, or if you want to begin being a YouTuber at all, it takes is just the time and the, the guts to get behind the camera. Uh, let me know what you guys think. I'd love to talk about this. This is just number one of a series I want to do. Um, next time, I'm going to kind of delve into something a little bit uh, different as well. So this time, Visitation Fiction. Next time, you know, the sky's the limit. So... Anyway, thanks guys. Thanks for watching. Also, if you get a chance at the filming of the time of the filming of this video, we are just shy of 500 subscribers. 
please share this video. Please subscribe. Please like uh, all that kind of great stuff. Um, I've decided that when we reach 500, which is a, a milestone for me, um, we, we would definitely give something away and make something awesome happen to the fans out there as well, too. So please, uh, like subscribe, share all that great stuff as well, too. If you like what you see, please, uh, continue to support us. I do this for free. I do this for fun. I do this for the passion of the hobby and, uh, I will always do it for free. So thanks everybody for watching. I'm Questwise, and until next time I'm out.